This conference will now be recorded. Um, thank you so much for all of you for coming to the OSP Lahore clinical meeting. This is a monthly meeting and we're fortunate to be presenting in the month of August and really, really close to the Independence Day. So please do stay back because we will be doing a cake cutting in honor of the Independence Day of Pakistan. And before we start, every uh, meeting, every talk, every discussion should begin with the name of Allah. So I would like to request Dr. Farhan Ali, our senior registrar, to present a few, uh, recite a few words. قسم ہے دھوپ چڑھتے وقت کی اور رات کی جب چھا جائے آپ کے رب نے آپ کو نہیں چھوڑا اور نہ بیزار ہوا اور بے شک آخرت بہتر ہے پہلے سے اور ان قریب آپ کا رب آپ کو عطا کرے گا تو پھر آپ راضی ہو جائیں گے کیا آپ کو نہیں پایا یقین پھر آپ کو ٹھکانہ دیا اور آپ کو پایا بھٹکتا ہوا پھر آپ کو راس جائی اور پھر آپ کو پایا مخلص تو آپ کو بے پرواہ کر دیا بس جو یتیم ہو تو اس کو مت دبا اور جو مانگتا ہو اس کو مت بھڑک اور جو احسان ہے تیرے رب کا اس کو بیان کر صدق اللہ العظیم Assalamu alaikum and uh, thank you so much for the for rising for this great anthem which we are all very proud of and uh, 
Now I would like to officially uh, start the meeting, clinical meeting, OSP Lahore, which is, we have the, um, given this opportunity and privilege to host it in Fatma Jinnah Medical University, which is affiliated with Sir Gangaram Hospital Lahore. And before I begin, I'd like to welcome uh, the President, OSP Lahore, uh, Professor Muin, who's also the principal of Gipo. Uh, he, I mean, whoever is sitting in the front is also part of the Fatma Jinnah, in fact, Sir Gangaram Hospital. He was, and he has uh, served his time in this uh, place also. Uh, Professor Zahir Kamal, ex-principal uh, Gipo, he also has been a professor of Sadangaram Hospital, Fatma Jinnah Medical University. Thank you so much for coming, sir. Dr. Shahzad Shafta, it was a pleasure to talk to you last night. And he has been a member of a British Pakistan Phenomenology Society, and he has come all the way from uh, Manchester, United Kingdom, to be a part of it. Welcome, sir. Dr. Shahid, who has worked in uh, Sheikh Zaid, and I'm really grateful that you're here. Kashif, um, Kashif Kutum and Kashif is only because we did our residency together, so he is a part and parcel of Fatma Jinnah. Welcome. And my faculty, uh, Dr. Noreen, who is now heading the Tata Darbar uh, uh, I department. Welcome, madam. And to my beautiful faculty, Dr. Abdul Rauf, Dr. Farhan Ali, Dr. Khuram Chauhan, Dr. Najam Iqbal, and Dr. Asma Rafi. Apart from that, my faculty, which we have as medical MS students and FCPS students, along with, we just got Dr. Maham back, who is a VR uh, phenomenology training. This is her first day. So I would like to welcome, and the faculty, I would like to welcome all of you, Dr. Tarek, Sajid, Adil, I'm sorry, I don't remember your name, Danish, Jojo is ko cover kar rahe hain, aap sab ka baut shukriya, because ye kele kaam ye sirka. All these decorations has been done by the donation, self donation, Hamari, starting from this LED, which was taken, which bought especially for this clinical meeting. This dice, this mic, the laptops, everything has been done by self financial of the faculty of uh, Sir Gangaram Hospital I Department. So we do as our staff for us. So, yes, baby has been created and has been inaugurated for this. So that's why we want to tell you how seriously we take our clinical meetings and we would want it to be one of the best because that's what we stand for. That is what the, this is also not just professionally, but professional. And I consider this meeting as a social professional activity. If we join together, we meet, uh, we become friends we, and we impart knowledge and we learn from each other. Before I start, uh, officially, I'd like to call Professor uh, Muin on the stage. He's the president of OSP. And so, I'd like to start with you. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Thank you very much, Professor Homa, for introducing me. And it's all a warm welcome from OSP Lahore for the uh, clinical meeting at Gangaram Hospital and Sir at Fatma Jinnah Medical University. It's always a pleasure to be here, and I've been a part of this institution before, and I, I think it's one of the one of the best institutions you have in Lahore, and Madam is doing a wonderful job keeping it forward. I think without further ado, we'll start off with the, the presentation by presenters. We've got four presentations, and we've got an international uh, lecture and a national lecture. And uh, at the end, we'll have sort of uh, the best speaker presentation uh, award, and then uh, followed by live. Thank you. Thank you, President Louis Pilhar. Uh, today we'll, we'll begin. Our first uh, presentation of today will be by Dr. Bushra, and she's going to introduce herself as to who she is, and then she will introduce the next speaker, Abusha. I am Dr. Bushra Ashraf, first year postgraduate trainee in ophthalmology department, Gangaram Hospital. So today I am going to present the case. The patient was 17 years old female, resident of Sarboda. He was admitted in ophthalmology department on 7th of March 2023 via OPD. Here, the picture of the patient is used after consent. 
This patient was presented with a complaint of mass in both eyes temporarily since birth. Mass in right eye was initially small, but it was gradually increasing in size from the last four years. It was associated with difficulty in completely closing the eye, foreign body sensation, disturbance in vision, and restricted eye movement. However, it was not associated with any redness or discharge. Patient was born full term by C-section. There was no history of intubation or delayed cry. She has normal developmental milestones. Her past medical and surgical history was not significant. Her parents having non-consanguinous marriage. There was no history of genetic disorder, diabetes mellitus, hypertension. Her father was smoker. There were six siblings, all normal. And she belongs to low socioeconomic status. On general physical examination, teenage girl sitting comfortably, well-oriented in time, place, and person, she was widely stable. On further examination, it revealed that she has bilateral preauricular tag, mandibular hypoplasia, as shown in this picture, high arch palate, facial asymmetry, small size thumb of both hands. On cardiopulmonary examination of the patient, to our surprise, we found that on auscultation, there was increased heart sounds on right side of the chest. So immediate chest x-ray was done, which revealed that patient has dextrocardia as shown here with arrow. Rest of the system examination was normal. On ocular examination, uncorrected visual equity in right eye 618, left eye 66, best corrected visual equity in right eye 66 with minus 2 cylinder, left eye 66, restricted abduction in right eye, and normal extraocular movements in left eye. On Hirschberg, there was central bilateral corneal light reflex. On further examination of the right eye, there was a mass infotemporally extending from the cornea towards lateral cancer, encroaching cornea with abundant hair on it. Mass was measuring 10 into 10 millimeter in size. Mass was also present in left eye, but it was small in size infotemporally near lateral cancer. Rest of the anterior segment examination was normal. On fundoscopy, there was no significant finding. So here you can see there was a mass infotemporally in right eye, 10 into 10 millimeter in size, and in left eye, which is comparatively small. So based on our history and examination, our provisional diagnosis was Golden Heart Syndrome, leading to dermal lipoma and liver dermoid. However, our differentials were Golden Heart Syndrome, Fischer Collins Syndrome, Char Syndrome, Renal Nervous Sebaceous of Jada Strong. So for definitive diagnosis of the patient, various investigations were carried out. These were all baseline MRI orbit uh, brain with contrast, echo. All baselines were in normal range, like CBC, LFTs, RFTs. MRI reports showed that the patient has bilateral orbital dermolipomas. Rest of the MRI brain was unremarkable, no shift of midline structure, normal parenchyma. Here is the echo report of the patient showing dextrocardia and normal biventricular systolic function. So based on our history, examination, and investigations, our definitive diagnosis was golden heart syndrome leading to dermolipoma and liver dermoid. So what is dermolipoma? Dermolipoma is basically choreostoma. That means it is normal histological tissue, but it is present at an abnormal location. It's, it is uh, similar in composition with normal dermoid, but also has fatty tissue, surface is retinized, and exhibits hair. So golden heart syndrome is oculo-auricular vertebral dysplasia. It has craniofacial anomalies, uh, vertebral defects like spina basica, ca cardiac defects, renal, and CNS defects. It usually consists of triad of anomalies like epidermal dermoid, accessory auricular appendages, and oral fistulas, as shown in this picture. So based upon the presenting complaint of the patient, as she has disturbance in vision, astigmatism, poor cosmesis, and disturbance in vision, so our treatment was surgical debulking of dermolipoma. 
Moreover, we also had multidisciplinary approach involving cardiac and ENT departments of the hospital as well. So here is the surgical video of debulking of dermolipoma. Dermolipoma is being separated from the limbus. Dermolipoma released from the limbus. Sphinx of Hazen bars to secure later rectus. This is very important uh, step in this surgery to secure the later rectus muscle because any damage to later rectus can lead to the post op strabismus. So it's better to secure it by passing sphinx hooks. Later rectus separated from the dermolipoma by passing sphinx hooks. Excision of the dermolipoma from surface of cornea. Dermolipoma is highly vascularized structure and surgery is very messy, so it's, uh, it is better to uh, ensure adequate homeostasis during surgery. While debulking, we should avoid aggressive debulking because any aggressive debulking can result in damage to adjacent structures like superior debulking can result in damage to lateral, uh, lacrimal operators and chronic dry eyes. So dermolipoma excised from lateral cancers. There's no lipoma that's acted from scara and debulking that. Conjunctiva closed by vital secretion. Post-operatively, we had given antibiotic eye ointments and drops and steroid drops to the patient for a period of two weeks. So MAS was also sent for histopathology, which revealed that it has goblet cells, conjunctival epithelium underneath, sebaceous glands, abundant adipose tissue. So our finding was dermolipoma. So this is the first post-op day picture and seventh post-op day picture of the patient, as shown by the arrow. You see the pre-op and post-op picture of the patient. So I would like to mention here that in this surgery, we have cosmetically and conservatively managed the patient in order to improve the symptoms of this tarbosome region, difficulty in completely closing the eye, and to, for good first message. However, limbal dermoid was adherent to the underlying cornea, uh, comprising of almost 80% of the thickness. So any excessive surgical debulking might result in uh, persistent epithelial defects, ulceration, and thinning. So we have considered second surgery for this patient. Uh, our various options for limbal dermoid surgical surgery are uh, lamellar keratoplasty with corneal sectarial grafts and amniotic membrane transplantation. So according to recent advances, a search was published in International uh, Journal of Ophthalmology. Here, they had done laminar keratoplasty with corneal sectarial graft for limbal dermoids. This search was conducted in Miami University, and there were eight patients with 30 uh, months follow-up. In this surgery, they had uh, proved that it was uh, associated with minimum intraoperative and postoperative uh, complications with better cost masses and good anatomic integrity. So our preferred surgical choice for this patient will be Lamellar keratoplasty with corneal sectarial graft once corneal graft is available. So there was one more research that while doing amniotic membrane transplantation for limbal dermoid, it is associated with pseudoterygium formation. So in one research which was uh, conducted, they proved that the use of mitomycin C during surgery is associated with minimal complication and least chance of pseudoterygium formation. Thank you. They were one together. Yes.
Also, we didn't was uh, stain. The request phase was less because it was gradually uh, gradual process. So request phase over here is very less for the moid and the molecular.
Assalamualaikum. My name is Dr. Ishban Jamil, PGR Second Year, SCPS Ophthalmology, Sarganga Ram Hospital, Lahore. Today, I will present the case. Our objectives are clinical assessment of patient and the treatment of disease. 43-year-old housewife, resident of Bihari, presented us in IOPD with a bilateral gradual painless dimnoid perfusion for two months and bulging of eyes for five months. Her eye bulging was associated with the neck swelling which she has for six years. There was weight loss of 11 kg from 60 to 49 kg within 8 months. She has dyspnea or thopnea for 5 months, dysphagia for solid for 5 months, and redness, watering, and grittiness of eyes for 4 months. Past ocular history was non significant. Patient was hyperthyroid due to multinodal goiter. Rest of the past history was non significant. Family history and personal history was non significant. She belongs to low socioeconomic class. Patient was on hyperthyroid treatment. She was taking one tablet carmimazole, 5 mg TDS, and one tablet propanolone, 40 mg TDS for 8 months. She was not allergic to any type of drug. Her patient was conscious well oriented to time, place, and person. Her heart rate was 88 beats per minute, temperature was 99 Fahrenheit, BP was 135. She has warm and sweaty skin, involuntary hand tremors were present, finger and no tail shrugging were absent. There was bilateral axial proctosis, dysphosis, poker, one graphite, del rimpel, and cell wet sign. Here you can appreciate the progress. There was rubbing multinodal mass in exposed part of the nest. We will discuss in detail. Pre tibial mixed edema was absent. She has dyspnea on exertion and orthopnea was also present. Dysphagia for solid while the rest of the system were normal. The visual acuity of right eye was 618. 
FI was 69 with no improvement on refraction. Color vision was normal. There was bilateral periorbital swelling. Hitchberg was central. Extraocular movement was limited. Bell's phenomena was decreased. There was lack of thalmos. Clear speech was normal. While commenting on adenecta, there was bilateral axial proptosis, conjunctival congestion, chemosis, and inflammation of crimson. Here you can see the point congestion, chemosis, inflammation of crimson. On checking the extraocular movement while doing the version, restriction was found in the left gaze, right gaze, and the inferior gaze with no improvement on reduction. Cornea was clear, AT was quite and calm, angle was open, pupil was round, reactive to light, nuclear viscosity was plus one, no vitreous activity was there, IOP was 18, bilateral fundus was normal. Nav feature sign was negative in both eyes. There was bilateral lower lid refraction. Low lid was 3 mm below the inferior limbus. Orbital margins were intact. On palpation, there is a retri decreased retropulsion. On Herter, there was protrusion of 24 mm bilaterally. On inspection, around 24 by 12 cm multinodal swelling was present in front of the neck, which moved with the swelling but not with the trunk protrusion. No skin changes, no visible veins, no signs of inflammation was there. Swelling was normal thermic, non tender, rubbery. Skin peak test was positive. Skin was fit to the underlying tissue. On percussion, resonance felt over the sternum, clavicle, superior to the and inferior to the clavicle. On auscultation, there was break. Provisional diagnosis is thyroid eye disease, while differentials are orbital pseudotumor, carotid covenous fistula, inflammatory orbitopathy, orbital myositis, and orbital tumor. Our CTC was within normal range, serum profile was within normal range, patient was Hep C positive, while TFTs were deranged. P3 was raised, while TSH was decreased. On ultrasound thyroid, there was bilateral low thyroid lobe and stomach enlarged, show multiple nodules, larger measuring the size of 7 to 4.4 cm. Vessels were displayed laterally, no cervical lymph adenopathy was present. On CT orbit, there were bilateral thickened extraocular muscle belly with sparing of muscle tendons, no intracolonal mass scheme, both optic nerves showed normal course. Here you can appreciate. We got the same report on MRI. So according to UGOGO classification, the clinical activity score of a patient is 5. She has eyelid swelling, eyelid erythema, conjunctival redness, chemosis, and inflammation of crimson. As the clinical activity score of our patient is greater than 3, so our case lies in moderate to severe category which is suggestive to start immunosuppressant. We give 9 tablets of oral prednisolone 5 mg with omeprazole, tapered according to effect for 2 months, lubricant eye drop according to need, and refer to surgical OPD to maintain the euthyroid state. On follow-up after 2 months, her U-Goco score decreased from 5 to 1, so her steroids were stopped and lubricant eye drops continued. Patient thyroid surgery has been planned on 17th of June. Complication. Proptosis, exposure to atopathy, corneal ulceration, infection, restrictive myopathy, optic neuropathy. We all know the pathophysiology of thyroid eye disease. There is activation of orbital fibroblast by TSH receptor antibody, which results in extraocular muscle enlargement and orbital fat extension. Streptomumab is monoclonal antibodies targeting the insulin ligose factor 1 receptor, which disrupts the crosstalk between insulin ligose factor 1 receptor and thyroid stimulating hormone, thus playing the crucial role in pathogenesis. 
on the basis of clinical trial treptomumab response rate is 74% while in case of steroid the response rate was 23 to 53% there was significant reduction in prognosis and hypoxia while in case of steroid there was little impact on prognosis so according to joint american thyroid association and european thyroid association treptomumab is preferable in patient where the main clinical feature is prognosis while systemic glucocorticoid is preferable in patient where the main clinical feature is soft tissue inflammation Treptomumab is very costly and is not available in Africa. This is picture taken while the patient was on steroids. Everything was going smooth. And this is picture taken yesterday, two weeks after stopping steroids. Leg swelling came back on stopping the steroids and facial puffiness also increased. It might be due to the use of steroids or due to the enlarged goiter causing the facial edema. So our, to our surprise, the dried visual acuity decreased from 618 to PLPR positive when we stopped the steroid and left visual acuity decreased from 69 to 618. Bilateral cornea was clear but on fundoscopy there was bilateral nasal disc margin blur. This is the coronal section of fresh MRI taken yesterday. Here you can appreciate the thickened muscle belly, bellies are compressing the optic nerve. So my question from house is, should we start steroid again, giving her IV antibodies for three days and shifting her to old steroid? Or should we, give, uh, should we go for the decompression surgery or just wait for a thorough surgery, then decide after that? They were NS plus one, but maybe they were start of the optic nerve compression. We didn't pick that. Yes, cellular vision was normal. On his yes, yeah, cellular vision was normal. Yes, RAPD was ne RAPD was negative. Red two percent was positive. They were yeah, yeah, they were. MRI was saying that there's a thickened muscle belly but sparing of muscle tendon but it was not saying that uh, there, there's nerve compression. In the start there was no nerve compression but after uh, giving steroid and stopping steroid after two weeks of stopping steroid we have seen that no uh, there's two weeks back. No, yes we tapered off. We give steroid we started with the nine tablets only and we tapered off weekly and after two months her steroid was stopped. And this picture, this MRI is yesterday, two weeks after stopping steroid. This confusion, yes, that's why this case is here. Yeah, later, sir. Initial axial map, ethnic coronal lima. I wish you were Yeah, this is the 
Uh, two weeks uh, back when we uh, stop the steroid, her glucose score decreased from five to one, and reason was same six eighteen. everything was normal. Yes sir. Yes sir, cardiac evolution was good, stop T was good, echo was everything was normal. Thank you sir. Thank you so much. Before uh, before going from anterior segment to posterior segment, we will like to give tribute to the Mohtarma Fatma Jinnah. Who is the greatest woman of Pakistan? After whom this institute has been named Fatma Jinnah Medical University.
will like to call Dr. Amisha Mirza on stage to present her case. My name is Dr. Ramesha Shi. I am FTPS fourth year teacher of ophthalmology at Sir Ganga Ram Hospital. Today I am presenting a case. My patient, 40 years old male, uh, worker by profession, resident of Lahore. He had it for 16 years, had four children, admitted by OPD on 23rd May 2023. He presented with dimness of VN in left eye for six months, gradual onset, and escalated with fatigue. There were no other complaints of photophobia, floaters, redness, and itching. His past worker history was not significant as there was no history of use of glasses, of any ocular medications, and any history of trauma later or surgery. His personal history was also not significant. He had history of cuff for three months. His one brother has history of hepatitis C, and his past surgical and medical history was also not significant. He had a history of cigarette smoker from last 20 years and alcohol intake, and he had allergy from Poland. His travel history was not significant, and he belonged to lower socioeconomic middle class. On ocular examination of the right eye, on ocular examination, the VN of the right eye was 6 by 6, but in the left eye, perception of light present, but the projection was positive. On lens changes, he got early cortical lens changes in the right eye, but in the left there was put here subcapsular or cataract of grade 4. In vitreous, there were cells of plus 1 in the right eye and cells of plus 4 in the left eye. So on fundus examination of the right eye, there were sclerosed vessels at the mid peripheral level and a fibrotic band extending from the disc along the supra super arcade and patch of NDE about 1 4 disc diameter along the infratemporal arcade. However, his macula was clean and normal. On the examination of the left eye, there is dense hazy view of fundus as the condensed lucus bands were adherent to the retina. So we go for B scan that shows the sectional retinal detachment. His general phase examination, my patient oriented at time, place, and person and was quite stable. His examining examination was also non significant. So our depressional diagnosis includes ECD, tuberculous vasculitis. Idiopathic retinal vasculitis, sarcoidosis, syphilis, acute retinal necrosis. So, our systemic investigation to confirm our provisional diagnosis, we had done baselines which were nominal, including serum calcium levels and chest x ray report. His chest x ray showed bilateral normal lung feeding. His HRCT test, as advised by the pulmonology department, shows bilateral apical sclerosis fibrosis in sequel or field inflammatory process. So other investigations include contiform TB gold test that was positive, VDRL test was negative, and serum ACE level was also negative. So our diagnosis is ECD. Our management includes put here subsinone, time stalone injection in the left eye, anti-tuberculous treatment, four tablets OG, and topical steroids for IV. We applied pan retinal photoregulation in the right eye to, uh, to, uh, to regress the NDE. The magic, uh, surgical management of the left eye includes straight-through magnification with an intraocular lens, scar scanner vitrectomy, angiolaser, and thousand PSG silicone oil. So this is the surgical treatment of the
No, no. If chess sector was normal, we have calibrated with the pulmonology department. So it was extra pulmonary TB. So that's why as Contifron test positive, so that's why on the basis of the Contifron and extra pulmonary, uh, we started ATP. If the uh, chest was clear, there was inflammatory process going on, but uh, that was clear and healed. Uh, so if decent chest sector was normal. Uh, as we have uh, uh, collaborated with the pulmonology department and discussed. Uh, no, no, there was no. No, no, sir. It was a uh, uh, pupil was. Yes, sir. Sir, it almost uh, one and a half months. Oh no, we will complete the course. Yes. So I would like to present my lab presenter, uh, Dr. Numan Kayoon. Thank you. Assalamualaikum. Uh, I'm Dr. Numan Kayum, third year resident, MS Ophthalmology, working at Sirangaram Hospital, Fatma Jinnah Medical University. So I'm going to present a case, a 22 year old female, unmarried student by profession, resident, resident of Kutlawala, presented to us in OPD on 6th of June with complaints of dimness in right eye for three months. This dimness of right eye was suddenly in onset 
progressive and painless. This dimness of VN was associated with headache, which was aggravated during study. Patient had no history of intraocular injections, laser, refractive glasses, or any kind of ocular trauma. On past medical history, patient had history of pulmonary TB nine years ago, for which she took anti TB drugs for nine months. The rest of the medical history was unremarkable. Patient was completely vaccinated according to the EPA guidelines, and there were normal developmental milestones. On allergic history, surgical history, family history, and gynecological history was unremarkable. On systemic inquiry, all the systems were unremarkable. These are the on general physical examination. These following are the vitals of the patient with BCS 15 by 15, and the systemic examination was unremarkable. On inferior segment examination, patient had real activity, pointy finger at one foot in right eye, and the rest of the interior segment examination was normal. Patient had intraocular pressure bilaterally 10, angle was open bilaterally. On, this is the fundus photograph of the right eye of the patient. You, you can appreciate there is vertically oval disc with neuroretinal rim missing spirotemporally, and there is 1 by 4 disc diameter optic disc width present spirotemporally. Optic, disc, uh, optic nerve margins are well defined with normal vasculature. Clinically, there was altered foveal, foveal reflex and there was 3 to 4 disc diameter of central serous macular detachment was present. This is the fundus picture of the left eye. There are artifacts superiorly and inferiorly, so kindly ignore those artifacts. On the basis of our clinical examination, our differentials were optic disc fit associated macropathy, central serous chorioretinopathy, optic disc coloboma, peripapillary steploma, and morning glory disc anomaly. Looking at the clinical examin of, examination of this patient, our provisional diagnosis was optic disc fit associated with serous macular detachment. Now we will work up for the uh, further plan and investigation. We wanted to check if patient had active TB because patient had history of pulmonary TB nine years ago. For that, sputum for AFB was done, which was negative. The rest of the baseline examinations were also negative. Patient was evaluated by the neurology department, declared neurologically fit by the neurology department. As you know that macular detachment, central serous macular detachment, it's also associated with use of oral contraceptive pills, use of progesterone. So we, we uh, evaluated the patient from the gynecological department and patient was uh, declared fit by the gynecological department and there was no use of, uh, no history of any use of oral contraceptive pills. Ocular examination, this is the right OCT picture of the patient. Patient had central serous macular detachment with macular thickness of 1507 micrometer. On the basis of our investigations and clinical examination of this patient, our plan was right irrigation aspiration with IOLM plant with 23 gauge PPV with ILM field, endo laser around the optic disc fit margins temporally and gas temporal. This is the patient.
patient came for follow up after uh, after one month we observed that patient had no visual improvement when we clinically examined this patient we observed that this patient had vitreous hemorrhage for that we planned vitreous lavage of this patient while doing vitreous lavage we observed that there was an active bleed present along the sphere vascular arcade so again laser was applied along the sphere vascular arcade this is the two month post follow up of this patient and this is the OCT picture of the right eye. You can see that macular thickness has been reduced to 226 micrometers from 1507 micrometers, which is very significant, I guess. This is the fundus photograph picture of the right eye. And there is optic disc bits. You can appreciate that there are laser marks on the sphere vascular arcade where there was active bleed trends at present, and there is no macular detachment present at the moment. And patient now has real equity 6 by 36, which is reduced, uh, which is improved from the pointer finger at one foot. So optic disc bit. Optic disc bit results from the incomplete embryonic tissue closure. It causes the herniation of surrounding disc plastic retina and fibrous tissue into the meninges through the defect in lamina cribrosa. So how develops the maculopathy? From where this fluid comes? There are three mechanisms explained for this maculopathy. One, that around the margins of optic disc bit, the membrane is highly porous and thin. So fluid can come from the vitreous cavity and there's pathway developed between the subretinal space and into the meninges. So CSF can also leak within the CSF, within the subretinal space from the CSF. And the fluid can also come from the leaking vessel or at the base of the bit. Treatment options. If you have not developed macular detachment yet, you can also apply the laser photoagregulation. Parts plan with tracheal with tamponade or without tamponade. There is a study uh, published in 2022 in Acta Ophthalmologica which states that parts plan with tracheal had with tamponade had better results as compared to the without tamponade and laser. So which tamponade? C3 or C3F8 or SF6? Gober et al. Post, uh, published a study in 2021 in which he explained BMT. The treat, uh, 29 eyes were treated for BMT and C3F8 and SF6 were compared. The results were that C3F8 had better anatomical uh, prognosis with 84% success rate as compared to SF6, which had 54% success rate. So keeping in mind that study, C3F8 was used in this patient. PP with inverted, uh, inverted ILM flap, you can also use inverted ILM, ILM flap. Human amniotic membrane plug can also be used to suck within the optic disc bit. The study published in American Journal of Ophthalmology in 2022, which states that using embryonic membrane plug, you can have better anatomical outcomes. Anterior lens capsule can also be used to stop within the optic disc bit, which also provides safe to use and also provides good anatomical outcome. Inner retinal fenestration also study published in case series in November 2022, which states that dual inner retinal fenestration provides good anatomical outcome in macular detachment. And PPV with autologous platelet concentrate. It is the latest study published in clinical and experimental ophthalmology in which patient's own plasma was used to draw the platelet concentrate and was injected while PPV and it's uh, provided proved that using autologous platelet concentrate provides better healing and good anatomical outcomes. Thank you. Thank you.
and then something happened and I called my manager and told them what I did. So he would take the competition and those competitions would make me feel good. And this is this is the take it good enough. So I should not be scared of those competitions. The important thing is that you should know, you should be competitive and you know you should know how to tackle it. And as such, I think you know anything can happen to you and you can actually try to do it. You start getting lost. No, that's a bit sad. Just at the end, at the end of your surgery, you'll have your long form and all that. And one thing that's very important is that when you go to these kind of complications, in these kind of physical cases, you need to have a backup. And that backup is going to be if they can be that comes to the back. So, in the initial end of the company, I just Asking you that uh, 
as we are applying laser on the plateau network, the just uh, Dr. Kassel also mentioned the same thing. So we can guide us that what is the end result of the laser we are looking for, I mean, what kind of reaction or what, uh, because this is a sensitive area, we can cause uh, increase the loss uh, if we are applying laser on the plateau network. Just should apply laser, a very light plan on just the pit margin, not the go all around it, right? If you are looking for pit margins, pit margins.
He is working as an assistant professor of neurology. He has done his fellowship in general medicine and fellowship in rheumatology. And he is not only the uh, elder department, but he has been integrated with CPSP with the uh, uh, level 4 induction program of CPSP. So only two departments of Gandhara Hospital are integrated with CPSP for level 4. One is a phenomenal department and the other one is that recently added in the level 4 program that is not available. He is a supervisor as well. So Dr. Pilar, please come and present the letter. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Pilar. It's really an honor to be here. And I'm extremely grateful to Professor Ma and uh, the society for this So, Mr. Pandyalini. Alright, he has already introduced me. I'm Dr. Pilar, and I'm the assistant professor of monology and head of the monology department at GNU. Uh, I was going through a few news, and I came to know that August is celebrated. US probably as the National Eye Exam Month. Um, and um, as it came to that, that is the vision pretty year over. So that brings us to this combination of ophthalmology and rheumatology. There are many diseases in which rheumatologists and ophthalmologists interact with each other and we um, have combined meetings and uh, how we share patients on each other. The most common diseases or the most common manifestations which I have come to in my career are uh, patients that have genealogists. Uh, they are the patients who are referred to us by ophthalmologists. And surprisingly, many of those patients, uh, in my practice, I found that they had uh, ankylosis on the white or on And really, they also had star fibrosis. So, UBIHS, IDS, and GA, UBIHS, posterior, or pan UBIHS, they have. Uh, uh, and underlying diagnosis, which most, most of the times is related to rheumatology. Other than that, the diseases which in the second in number in my observations are retroorbital tumors or masses. Uh, there are a few patients which uh, I have seen in my career which have retroorbital tumors or masses and they were found to have redness granulomatosis or IgG4 related diseases. The important thing is uh, in both the cases, either it's UBIHS or Retroorbital tumors. Uh, when you treat the patient for the rheumatological disease, the eye complications or the eye manifestations tend to. Improve. I remember a patient who had a retroorbital mass and was found to have IgG4 related disease. She was on steroids and um, disease modifying as has happened, and currently her um, I think vision is improved and her sportomized reduced to a pinpoint or something. So let's move on to today's uh, discussion. I want to present a real world scenario to you. Uh, a patient that came to me, who's been seeing me for about a year. She is a 55 years old female. She was diagnosed with lupus in 2015. And recently she had lupus nephritis. And the kidneys were involved and she had protein. So we started our own treatment and gave her steroids and cyclophosphonates and that's the one we have in the meantime, she was a hydroxychloroquine since 2005. Now, uh, two to four months back, she started complaining of blood, very low pressure. When she came to me and referred her to an ophthalmologist, now what happened, uh, she was seen by one ophthalmologist and she went out to see another ophthalmologist. Her OCD was advised, and that showed initial minor changes in the mind. Now, uh, the ophthalmologist recommended that we should either stop hydroxychloroquine or switch to another. Now the problem happened that when I stopped her hydroxychloroquine, her neuritis was better, but she started feeling her heart pains. Now I was in a condition that uh, if I give hydroxychloroquine, there is a risk on her vision. And if I don't give hydroxychloroquine, she is almost wheelchair bound and better. So we are seeing it fully how can we improve her or give some alternate drugs. In the meantime, we do uh, increase the dose of uh, steroids and then we see. So, there are problems which uh, uh, come and rise here, and it is important that uh, ophthalmologists and rheumatologists stay in touch with each other to identify these problems early and to look at the patient as a whole. So, let's move on to the topic. I have tell you about a few anti barriers. There are three anti barriers in the First is hydroxychloroquine which is given about 5 milligrams per kilograms per day and it 
comes in a tablet of 200 milligrams, so we give it at a two of 100 milligrams once a day or maximum load of 200 milligrams once a day. Next is protein, the uh, well-known drug, and it comes in 50 milligrams per day most given. And the last one is phenapine, which is given at 100 to 200 milligrams per day. If it is given with hydroxychloroquine, then those are the But unfortunately, this is not available in one There are a few important points about these drugs. They are not affected by food. They are spitting 50% of the urine. And if there is renal dysfunction, the dose needs to be used. And if the patient has got renal failure, they cannot be dialyzed with the renal analysis. So, uh, I'll present you two guidelines for which are taken from uh, the guidelines of American Academy of Ophthalmology, the American College of Ophthalmology, the Royal College of Ophthalmology, the Ramsco, the Royal College of Society, and the American Academy of Ophthalmology. So let's talk about this drug, which is most commonly given to these patients is hydroxychloroquine. It acts by accumulation in the lysosomal vessels and that then disrupts the DNA, causing the uh, manufacturing of all life receptors and increases the level of intermediate. Now, you see, interleukins are the main chemicals that cause manifestations of the rheumatological disease. So, if hydroxychloroquine reduces interleukin, Indirectly, several effects of the disease are reduced. So, what benefits are caused by this drug? They increase the LDL receptors and lower the risk factors. So, all patients with autoimmune diseases are at a high risk of having cardiovascular events or cerebral vascular events. So, if these drugs reduce the limits, they will improve uh, or reduce the chances of cardiovascular events. They decrease insulin degradation. They inhibit platelet aggregation for the uh, events of thrombosis are reduced. Why I am telling this that these are all the reasons why even if ophthalmologists sometimes say that there is a slight risk, we still try to reduce the dose and give hydroxychloroquine because of this medication. And some diseases which I'll tell you, the commonest diseases that are in which hydroxychloroquine is used, the first disease is SA. In SA it is said, patients who max a cathode will have me. And that is hydroxychloroquine. Because of the many beneficial effects it has in preventing the complications, like cardiovascular, or in the blood related complications, or even prevention of lupus and fractures and skin improvement and other So that's why it's important even for the to know that when we should stop hydroxychloroquine and then we should continue to give most common disease in which it is used is lupus, then antiphospholipid syndrome, dermatomyositis, and rheumatoid arthritis. These four indications in which we have hydroxychloroquine for a longer duration, in lupus probably is called lifelong, and you know, therefore it is needed that we uh, uh, look at the patient for hydroxychloroquine related uh, toxicities early and even throughout the disease. The less uh, common uses are shoggins, juvenile lupus arthritis, sarcoidosis, and rarely it is given. One important thing is because uh, the patients who have lupus are mostly in uh, females of childbearing age. So they plan to have their families and they plan pregnancies. So the most important thing to remember to be tell and be attractive and positive, both this hydroxychloroquine is safe throughout pregnancy, uh, before pregnancy, and even after pregnancy and during pregnancy. There are several side effects. The uh, eye related side effects I tell at the last. There are a few common side effects like nausea, vomiting, uh, CNS features like headache, dizziness, myopathy, neuropathy. Sometimes myopathy is very common. And other rare effects are congestive heart failure. With quinoa pain, you can have a plastic anemia, G6 P deficiency, a rash. This one is also uh, interesting for the patient hyperpigmentation. They get gray black. With chlorine and hydroxychloroquine and yellow discoloration with pina uh, For me, you usually prescribe sun. So, in every prescription or most of the prescription, where patients are on hydroxychloroquine, you usually prescribe a sunblock every day to prevent the uh, hyperpigmentation. And sunblock has to be a special SPF factor, ideally more than 60. 
which I was telling you to do that the 60 number means a special thing. That it means two things. The duration in which it protects you and the strength of the radiation uh, against which the sunblock protects you. So, when you have a sunblock, you can use the number of the sunblock. So, this one which I will answer. That in toxicity is related to the dose of hydroxychloroquine and the length of use of hydroxychloroquine. She was a patient in Italy. She was taking hydroxychloroquine since 2006 and she had started feature in 2020. Important thing to note is that the overall risk is 1% to maximum 7.5%, and it depends on a few factors like the dose. Mostly the dose is less than or uh, 5 milligrams per day. If it is used for 5 years, the risk is just 1%. If it is used for 10 years, still the risk is less than 10 If it is used for 20 years, our patient was on since 2015. So, five to three can count them, she was on probably for 18 years. So, the risk even at 10 years is less than 2%, and in 20 years it is approximately 20%. And the important thing is this anti mediator does not have. It can cause skin complications and aplastic in them, but it is not available in Pakistan. First evidence of toxicity, which I usually ask from the patient that may come to me, which is just simple, that you ask the patient about red perception. The first uh, evidence that toxicity is going to start is the loss of red perception. If you stop the at this point, it is reversible. So, what is the mechanism of toxicity? The chloroquine uh, uh, <coughs> binds to cordial and RPE that will be meant to have chloroquine more than hydroxychloroquine, they can be coronary deposits. But if they are coronary deposits, there is no need to stop hydroxychloroquine. The only stop and edge is recognized. Now, there are two studies from Pakistan. Both here, this was done by Dr. Saya uh, and Zishan in Fatma uh, Mohammed Hospital. And they looked at this thing that screened. The adequacy, it was basically an audit for the report on this as well. That are we giving or are the patients being prescribed adequate dose and are they following a regular monitoring pattern for adequacy? What they found? Significant patients were under underdosed. In one sense, it was better that if they are underdosed, they are less likely to have uh, toxicity, but the efficacy would be more. And the second thing was patients had. Minimal compliance to uh, monitoring and tests that should be carried out for checking by hydroxychloroquine. This was published in RGMU in 2008. Next study was done by Bai and Dr. Harun, also at FMA, and they looked at hydroxychloroquine toxicity in nocturnal neurological diseases and they found that there is a positive correlation, which at least in the literature, with the duration of hydroxychloroquine therapy and the retinal toxicity. This was also published in 2008. So I will present you a joint statement of KCR, AD, RDS, and ELO about the monitoring of hydroxychloroquine first. And the most important is the communication between the patient, between the rheumatologist, between the oxygen. That we need to communicate that I am going to look for, uh, or I am sending you a patient to specially look at hydroxychloroquine yeah. Uh, it kind of happens that we send the patient to eye department and the neurologist or the patient doesn't try and the patient comes back and tells us he gave the number of the and he gave number of the line. So we need to uh, uh, write a, a note to the ophthalmologist that how should, uh, what are we looking for and why they are sending the patient. As in other uh, specialties, adoption of a more sensitive testing modalities and baseline testing should be done and annual testing is done five years. And the most important thing for us is the long stop the drug for uncertain So, what are the guidelines for this? If there are no risk factors, uh, if there are few risk factors, then examine the patient every year. The first thing is to examine the patient at the baseline level before starting hydroxychloroquine or within a year. Secondly, if the patient has two risk factors, like age more than 60, you are giving chloroquine, you are giving a higher dose more than 5 milligrams. The patient has renal or liver involvement. The patient is on the oxygen due to some malignancy or some uh, other drug. Or there is 
concomitant retriever or mentor damage, then you need to examine the exam. Otherwise, you are baseline exam at one year. If there is no risk factor, don't do anything for five years. After five years, then annual screening of the patient. And if there are risk factors, then do it every year. Modern screening have improved our vision and knowledge that modern screening detects retinopathy early before even it's visible in the front. It was uh, new for me also because when I used to send the patient, I used to write new different hospitals. But the modern methods are better and they detect uh, the changes even before they are present on the front hospital. So what are the recommendations for this? That two tests should be done primarily. Automatic visual key testing and SQC. So these both of them should be done. I'll show you an algorithm according to the guidelines that what should be done. Other tests that can be done if they are available are these two. Or newer tests that can be done are micro palimetry or adaptive optic resonance. Foreign tests should not be done. It's very important for us also that we need to know that you should not uh, ask for ophthalmologists to do this. And also for the ophthalmologists to know that these tests will not be relied upon for diagnosing a patient that was supporting the surgery. Fungus examination, time to be OCG, fluorescing and geography, full field DRG, Amstrad grid testing. Vishay was thought that Amstrad is the best method to diagnose when you see the lines uh, distorted and you can see the elevation and color testing and things. Uh, some strikes that when did these four and three tests should be done? Automated visual CD and SUC. And the uh, AO and uh, ACR has recommended that you. Either automatic visual fees, uh, both automatic visual fees and SQC. And these tests should not be done. This is a very algorithm, but to do when you start a patient on hydrocyclic or thing like we do. So get an earlier uh, eye examination. Uh, if there are no risk factors, even if there are risk factors, if there are no risk factors, then monitor after every five Monitor, then monitoring start after five years. For five years with the initial. Uh, eye testing is normally going to show If there are factors like anoxic being used, renal dysfunction, liver dysfunction, or the patient is on a, on a higher dose, or the patient is on protein, then monitoring begins after exactly one year of starting. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Yes, yes, yes. Because I thought the uh, of uh, I started practice with the neurologist, the professor, the first day I have for 10 years. For the last 20 years, I'm practicing with the mm -hmm. So I see a lot of reference from me. Uh, and sometimes when they are starting treatment, so they have uh, one uh, checkup before they start. Because they want to show there is no uh, baseline, and baseline there is no methodology, which later on by this day can be attributed to the Exactly. So ideal thing would be to get an eye examination, then start and toxicology or if that is not possible, ideally at the initial or within the first year, as soon as you can. Red desaturations. Red is the most important color. So, if there are two bottles, like eye drop, and they find out, look for red desaturation, that is the only sign. And the field is there, you can see that you can see that red color is the target. Should not with any other. The red target. Exactly. That will That's be the earliest. Well, I think it's a matter of two to nine other things. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, So, initially, uh, before starting or within the one year, you get based on eye exam. If there are no risk factors, do after five years. If there are risk factors, then yearly monitoring is advised. What to do? Get both tests, visual field testing and SDOCG. If they are abnormal, it is diagnosed for us. If one of them is abnormal, get um, free visual field testing. If that's abnormal, it also confirms processing. If both are normal, then you can repeat it annually. And if a visual field is also normal, then you can move on to it after you. And if there are uh, signs of definite toxicity, then you need to stop and and we need to into other drugs that may be used. Like in that patient, we use other drugs. Um, um, we are thinking of like increasing uh, steroids. Speaking of 
Thank you, Professor Huma, for invitation. The presentation is called Tips to Identify Glaucoma in Tilted, Myopic, and Anomalous Shaped Optic Nerve Heads. And the aim of the presentation today is to discuss with you the structural changes which happen in disc and retina in glaucomatous patients with increasing frequency, and these changes are not found in healthy eyes. I would like to alert you to these changes, which are mentioned here, and these changes are found with increasing frequency in eyes suffering with glaucoma as compared to eyes which are not suffering with glaucoma. And I would like to make a case that all of these changes are actually belong to a single family. Um, I may not be able to discuss the evidence of each one in depth, but I hopefully I would like to make a case that all of these changes are part of the single family and then trigger a meaningful discussion afterwards. But before I proceed further, I would like to mention this brilliant uh, photograph uh, which is called the blind men and the elephant so here you will see five blind men feeling different parts of an elephant the one who is holding the tusk of an elephant may say oh an elephant looks like a spear and the other blind person who's looking or holding the trunk of elephant may say that elephant looks like a snake the one who's feeling the belly of elephant may say that elephant looks like a wall. 
and the one who's holding the tail may say the elephant looks like a rope, whereas the one holding the legs of elephant may say the elephant looks like a tree. So the purpose of sharing this photograph is to say that the mind does not see sorry the eye does not see what the mind does not know and hence i would like to raise these points these subtle changes in ocd scan which you can pick up and then perhaps mitigate the management of glaucoma but before I proceed, I would also like to mention that no method is fully validated yet for clinical use. These points that I'm going to share are for you to identify the risk that you might be facing, which may, you may not identify otherwise. And the good performance in studies does not guarantee a good performance in the clinic. So please do not take these findings as the sole reason to diagnose glaucoma. Glaucoma by World Glaucoma Congress is defined, the standard of glaucoma diagnosis is defined as a progressive disease. It all started with what is called hypodense holes in nerve fiber layer. If you look at the circumpapillary scan of the optic nerve head, which is probably the most efficacious OCT scan that you can find, you will notice that in areas, at certain areas, um, these hypodense holes, which is an area where there is not much reflectivity, and if you look closely in these areas, the nerve fiber layer may appear to be of the standard thickness. Hence, you can find erroneous false negative uh, printouts by the OCD scans in these machines. Whereas these hypodense holes, they suggest that most of the nerve fiber layer in this area has actually perished. So in this study by Zen et al., uh, they, they, had, they recruited 110 patients and 208 eyes. Well, um, so they found in about 25% of patients and in about 16% of eyes, they could see these hyperdense holes. And uh, very interestingly, these holes were not found in the control set of control arm so zero patients in the control arm had these hypertense holes and mostly uh, when they then when they plotted when they plotted the uh, holes um, they found that most of these holes they were actually found adjacent to the blood vessels in the superior and the inferior poles so, uh, so for these scan, this is the um, you know, one of the cube scan and NFOS NFOS projection. Um, so you can see over here the blue line, which is also presented here, is 1.2 millimeter away from the disc margin. The green is 1.7, and the red is 2.4 millimeter. So wherever they found the hole, they marked the position. And you can see that these holes, they appear to be in an arcoid bundle fashion. Uh, in this specific case, they are not adjacent to the blood vessels, but they were still in an arcoid uh, fashion, indicating damage in the nerve fiber layer. So this is an, another example of hypotense hole. So this is a circumpapillary scan. As I mentioned, one of the most useful scans in glaucoma. And here you can clearly see a hypertense hole. If I mark this position, this is somewhat very similar to this uh, wedge defect that you can see here, over here, and as well as it's identified over there. You can see the line corresponding to the hypertense hole 
is also the line corresponding to the no fiber layer defect. Now, not in glaucoma, but um, Marocca et al. Uh, presented this paper uh, about PERD, or also known as paravascular inner retinal defect. Now, all of these eyes, they mentioned these changes in these patients, and all of them, about 90% of them, they were myopic, and a fair amount of them had a retinal membrane. Uh, I'll come back to this point a bit later, but it is now uh, also known that fair amount of glaucoma patients also have epiretinal membrane. And as you know, that the, uh, in myopia, the risk of glaucoma is also higher. So what they found was that these hypodense changes along the, you can see these hypodense changes uh, and uh, along the blood vessels. So if you look at the scan at point C, you can see the uh, appearance of the defect is like this, whereas at point B, the, uh, the appearance of the defect is like this. So the point I want to make is that the uh, appearance of these paravascular inner retinal defects is different at different locations, but they follow an awkward pattern along the blood vessels. So over here you can see too, so this is the blood vessel and over here you can see these changes around the uh, blood vessels and you can see them along the blood vessels as you go around it. So what researchers did, um, they went back to the same set of patients um, as presented in the earlier slide. So the earlier slide represented those uh, paravascular changes in myopic and epiretinal membrane patients. But what researchers did, now this time they went back and they uh, plotted the paravascular defects uh, which were present in an arcuate fashion because arcuate uh, loss is very typical to glaucoma only. So what they found um, that the red dots, they, they represent an arcoid damage, the blue dot that represented myopia only, and the green dot represented epiretinal membrane only. And then you can see that these paravascular inner retinal defects, they are found in both in glaucoma patients, uh, as well as in the myopia patients, as well as in the patients with epiretinal membrane, and they can also be found uh, in patients who have all three of these diseases. So um, these paravascular inner retinal defects, um, uh, they can be uh, contributed by, by myopia, by epiretinal membrane, and as well as by glaucoma. Okay, so moving on to next related condition, uh, so-called PPRS or peripapillary retinoschisis. Now, I'd like to mention that this peripapillary retinoschisis is not only associated with glaucoma, but it's also associated with rapidly progressive glaucoma, both structurally and functionally, i.e. you can see the changes, uh, rapid changes in glaucoma progression, both on OCT and as well as on visual fields. And it was also found that this rapidly progressive glaucoma is significantly faster than uh, the control eyes, which contain no glaucoma or glaucomas with no peripapillary uh, retinoschisis. Now, so what is peripapillary retinoschisis? Um, so you can see there is a split uh, above the ganglion cell layer. And the segmentation, if you look at the, if you ask the OCT scan machine to churn out the segmentation, you will find the uh, nerve fiber layer here to be um, way above, the, the nerve fiber layer thickness to be way above normal. But of course, that's, that's false negative. Uh, and you would also see that in 2010, the nerve fiber layer thickness churned out by machine could be significantly bigger as compared to 2013, where 
you, the nerve fiber layer may show thinning. However, if you look at the uh, circumpapillary scan and, and realize that the thickness presented initially is as a false negative, and if you look closely, you will see that this reduction in nerve fiber layer is nothing but uh, the reduction in the uh, peripapillary schisis. And also, this in this case, the peripapillary schisis is um, closer to the optic nerve head, and as you move away from the retina, the uh, peripapillary retina schisis reduces or is virtually absent. So this is again peripapillary <coughs> retina schisis, uh, and it shows that in 2010, um, you could see few early changes right there. And then when you see the patient again, the changes are gone. And the next time you don't see them, and then they come back at a different place. Uh, and as the time passes by on the next visit, you can see them less and less. And by the time the last test was done in 2015, although you cannot see retina schisis, but the nerve fiber layer has completely gone away. And you can see these blood vessels are now completely naked and they are almost protruding into the vitreous. Over here, you can see these blood vessels are very nicely covered by the nerve fiber layer. And over here, you can see the nerve fiber layer, the blood vessels are completely naked. Okay, the, another thing um, uh, that this peripapillary retina schisis can be found in both eyes and it can come and go. So you can see on, uh, on this side, in this eye, uh, if you look at the, the segment of the uh, circumpapillary sweep, so you can see the retina schisis here, which is in 2009, looks like that. 2010, it changes, gets a bit worse, 11, a bit worse. And by the time it goes away in 2014, you can see the nerve fiber layer is significantly less as compared to 2009. Similarly, in the other eye, if you look at this segment where there is retina schisis, and uh, it's also important to realize that there is no vitreoretinal traction in these cases. So you will see that um, there is no uh, traction, there is no retina schisis in 2009. Um, then you can see one in the next visit, it's gone, and then it comes back again, and by the time it goes back again, uh, the nerve fiber layer thickness here is significantly less as compared to the initial findings. Also, I would like to uh, mention that in um, this retina schisis, it can come and go. For example, this is the same patient 2018, and you cannot see any uh, retina schisis, but then in 2021, you can see uh, retina schisis appearing at this case. So the retina schisis can increase in size or decrease in size, can come and go, uh, and is associated with uh, rapidly progressive glaucoma, and hence the clinician should be mindful of this condition. So coming to the uh, uh, another term called disc schisis, so over here you can see uh, peripapillary retina schisis, but this may actually be uh, a consequence. Not necessarily. That, that's a far. Uh, uh, if we go into more depth, we can realize that this can happen even without any mechanical changes. However, um, in glaucoma, where the intraocular pressure is leading to mechanical changes and deformation of the lamina. So we can see as the lamina sinks, uh, the neurons which are passing through the lamina cubrosa, they cannot slide in and out because they're contagious, uh, with, uh, contagious with, the, uh, with the lamina cubrosa and they're also contagious with the, uh, with the peripapillary tissue. So as the lamina cubrosa deforms, the tug onto these neurons and the adjacent supporting tissue leads to the disc schisis and as well as the peripapillary schisis. So the point I'm trying to make is that this peripapillary retina schisis and disc schisis may be a part and parcel of the same condition. And also, if you look, these changes in different scans, whether in a circular scan or 
a longitudinal scan or a FOSS scan. So you can see that the same thing may appear as arrhythmiasis here, may appear as the um, microcystic changes, which I'll discuss later, or they will uh, they can appear as the hypotense holes. So hypotense holes, microcystic changes, arrhythmiasis, all of these uh, may reflect the uh, same process which is going on in a rapidly progressive or in, in a progressive glaucoma. So um, this is the microcystic changes in the inner nuclear layer which I was discussing in the earlier slide. So you can see uh, on the left hand side of this red line is the patient compared with the control at the same spot and you can see and that over here, the, there are microcystic changes in the inner nuclear layer. Inner nuclear layer appears to be significantly thicker as compared to the control. And you can see the nerve fiber layer uh, has almost gone away as compared to the control. Now, these microcystic changes are typically seen in more advanced cases of glaucoma, like optic atrophy or terminal cases of glaucoma. Uh, and if you review literature, and non-glaucoma literature may suggest that it's associated with demyelinating disease and optic neuritis. However, uh, in, in the mechanics and the uh, mechanical engineering models of the optic nerve head and the peripapillary tissue uh, and the retina suggest that it may not be associated with the demyelinating disease. Rather, it may be due to the spring-like nature of the molar cells. Molar cells, they behave like springs and when the exons, they degenerate and there is no inertia holding them, they suddenly get bigger. Um, thus enlarging, this creating these spaces which um, do not show any evidence of leakage on fundus fluorescein angiogram. So uh, coming to another very interesting um, uh, finding in glaucoma patients and progressive glaucoma patients is the position of the blood vessel. So as the lamina cabrosa sinks and, and as the uh, all the tissue is um, not sliding through it, it's firmly attached to the uh, lamina and the adjacent tissues. So everything can be dragged into the optic nerve head. And here you can see in this patient the uh, from the this is a dismargin and this is the first bifurcation of the uh, of the blood vessel the distance is from the first bifurcation dismargin is called uv and the same patient in timeline with advancing glaucoma you can see the the distance the uv has reduced as the blood vessels get dragged as the lamina cabrosa deforms and sinks So this is again uh, from Topcon OCT Triton Plus. So you can actually see the enhanced view of the lamina. Um, uh, not very sensitive, but then again, you can get fairly good sign. This uh, white line is actually the lamina carosa. And you can see the lamina over here at the same spot. Um, the segmentation has been manually corrected. Uh, you can see a fairly robust line where over here you can see the fragmentation of the lamina um, and defund deformation so which is again an indication that there is mechanical damage going on onto the optic nerve head this is again a very useful scan but you have to use a vertical scan uh, through the fovea and you can clearly even without any, if the segmentation is correct, and even without any, uh, without the help of any software, you can see that the thickness on this side is more as compared to the thickness, this asymmetry of the nerve fiber layer on a vertical scan, not on a horizontal scan, but on a vertical scan can also suggest evidence of glaucoma. So coming to uh, the conclusions of the discussion we had, that uh, glaucoma exerts a mechanical impact on the retina and the manifestations could range from hypodense holes to peripapillary retinoschisis to PERD,
to inner nuclear layer pseudocyst and disc schises. And if you see peripeplar retinoschises or disc schises, then the uh, then this is an indication of a rapidly progressive glaucoma. And the inner nuclear layer uh, pseudocyst, because they're not really leakage, um, they are associated with um, swear loss of the uh, exons. Uh, and typically in more advanced glaucoma and is also associated with rapid progression. So, uh, and also as the optic nerve head sinks, it can also drag the blood vessels along with it. Um, and uh, it can lead to the reduced distance from the disc margin to the first bifurcation of the blood vessels. I hope so these subtle signs would help to identify um, glaucoma or a progressive disease in an otherwise difficult to assess optic nerve heads such as in myopia uh, or uh, anomalous shaped optic nerve heads. Thank you very much. Compared to the thickness, this asymmetry of the nerve fiber layer on a vertical scan, not on a horizontal scan, but on a vertical scan can also suggest evidence of glaucoma. So coming to uh, the conclusions of the discussion we had that uh, glaucoma exerts a mechanical impact on the retina and the manifestations could range from hypodense holes to peripapillary retinoschises to PERD to inner nuclear layer pseudocyst and disc schises. And if you see peripapillary retinoschises or disc schises, then the uh, then this is an indication of a rapidly progressive glaucoma. And the inner nuclear layer uh, pseudocyst, because they're not really leakage, um, they are associated with um, swear loss of the uh, exons, uh, and typically in more advanced glaucoma, and is also associated with rapid progression. So, uh, and also as the optic nerve head sinks, it can also drag the blood vessels along with it. Um, and uh, it can lead to the reduced distance from the disc margin to the first bifurcation of the blood vessels. I hope so these subtle signs would help to identify um, glaucoma or a progressive disease in an otherwise difficult to assess optic nerve heads, such as in myopia uh, or uh, anomalous shaped optic nerve heads. Thank you very much. This conference will now be recorded. Dr. Adulu, Dr. Banana Ali, Dr. Asma Ali, Dr. Kulantan, this is Amir. Sir, ye jo kuch hua hai, ye main kya nahi kar sakti. Faculty ki bagay, nothing can be done. So I just want to thank all of them, and I would like you to clap for us. And thank you so much to all of you for being a part of this department and making it work. Sari ka sari ka kuchh hai, aur sari faculty chote bade sari mein jo jo hamara house par aur kuch bhi chal raha hai, hamara teacher bhi chal raha hai, hamara ye bhi chal raha hai. So iska matlab hai ki start hai dekhiye, aur kisi ko mein se tum change nahi kar, ham problem to bhi nahi aate. So iska matlab hai ki you have done a good job. I would like to invite Professor Moin, President Wilson Lahore. To come and announce the uh, the, uh, the best speakers, and apart from that, sir, Madhu Jhabi sir, please sir, I am to say, after you are Madam Praveen sir, Selim, thank you so much for coming, sir, Shahzad, sir, Azad Aslam, sir, Shahzad, the the joint secretary, Madam sir, thank you. All of you, please come. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Kelly. Sir, 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 Thank you for an excellent uh, show over here. And I'd like to invite President Ajahn Malish to be honored for announcing the results of the uh, participants of the speakers today. Uh, all had good presentations, and it was very difficult to decide the position, but the judges have come up with a position 
So, uh, first I would like to call Dr. Anusha Rashid uh, for answer dictate. Dr. Anusha Rashid. Third position goes to Dr. Iqbal Jami. And second position goes to Duman Kayu of the state. Thank you very much for very interesting videos. And for first position, Dr. Bushra And the next clinical meeting will be on 9th September in Papa Memorial Hospital. Uh, as a token of appreciation, we would like to uh, hand over or present a bouquet to Dr. Bilal, who came specially for many things in the now show Jake. I 